Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. Let us know how you're doing and where you're tuning in from. I see we've got a lot of folks from all over the world, and I know all of us are experiencing some pretty strange times right now. We're probably most of us working from home, which is why we're doing today's session. I'm really excited. Today's session's a little bit different. We're not doing tutorial style. You might notice we've got three guests today. We've never had three guests, so I'm pretty excited to introduce our guest today. If you have questions that pop up along the way, please use the ask a question area below. And again, I'd love to hear where are you from? I'm assuming everybody's working from home. Let me know if you're working from home. Um, let me know also if you're an employer or an employee. I'm kind of curious kind of where people um, where people stand on that and kind of how long you've been working remote. Is this something that's new to you right now or have you been working remote for a while? Everyone here on this call has been working remote for a pretty long time. I think we're all pretty you know, remote advocates um, running our own businesses. Dominican Republic. Uh, I know someone here was from Italy. I'm, I'm really curious how things are going there. Can you guys hear me okay? Bob just said audio. Glasgow, cool. Sweden, San Francisco, Las Vegas. Very cool. So yeah, let me know in the, in the sidebar how long you've been working remote. Yeah, working from home. Second, second week remote working. Okay, so yeah, a lot of people are going to be facing some pretty interesting challenges because I think um, I'd love to hear from all of you actually, um, you know, how long yourselves you've been working remote as well. Um, but yeah, before we dive in, I want to introduce you to my guest today. I'm really, really excited. So um, Tara McMullen, we've known each other on actually all of you have met remotely, which is pretty cool. So uh, Tara McMullen of the What Works Network, known each other for many, many years. Um, if you don't, if you aren't familiar with the What Works Network, definitely check it out. What I love about what Tara is doing right now is really active conversations about remote events. I know a lot of people who are doing in-person events are going to be kind of thinking about ways to move it online. Thor, I know that um, you're, you've mentioned your partner as well is kind of facing those challenges now. So. Tara, thank you for joining us today about this conversation. Um, Thor is a product manager by day, creative full, full stack creative by night. Um, and I know you've been working with a team of about 25 or so, facing the challenges of getting people uh, coordinating using Notion as well. That's something that we're going to talk a little bit about is how do you get your team using these tools together to work effectively. So thank you, Thor, for joining us today. And those of you that aren't familiar, my husband, Ben, is joining us today. We've been running our company since you know, 2014 maybe, and we've both been working remotely probably for about uh, 10 to 12 years now. So we, we've done the work from home thing for a very, very long time. It's taken a while to kind of build up those routines. Um, and, you know, as Tara can attest, it's not business as usual because a lot of us are working from home, but we might be working home from home with like multiple other members of our families, whether it's children, whether it's other partners. Um, so today's session is going to be pretty open ended. Um, we want to be here to answer any questions, share some resources. Again, all of us kind of have a bit of a different conversation around working remote. Um, ben is working with a team of about 100 or so folks, um, a much smaller, I think, group of those that actually are using Notion, for example, for uh, collaborative purposes. Um, so Ben, I don't know if you want to uh, touch on that as well, just to kind of say, like, how many folks are you collaborating with and kind of what, uh, you know, how you're using Notion to actually make that work? Yeah, you want me to touch on that now or later? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, actually, everybody is pretty much on Notion now. So we have about 100 and, 110 with all of our contractors. And I think there's about 80 full time employees that are using it. Um, so one of the one of the things that I've been really excited about with Notion is the the way that we collaborate within our our groups. We we use this um, this uh, organization method. It's a flat flat organization method that's based on a sociocracy called holacracy, where nobody has a real like a title per se. You have you hold multiple different roles, and you can you can be assigned and removed from roles, and that determines your your accountabilities at the company. And so we have these things called circles, which you know we have the tech circle, we have a coaching circle, and marketing circles, and things like that. So uh, me and Roy, the the guy who manages all our internal systems, set up this system where we have a sort of uh, groups in Notion that are based on our sort of on, uh, like a loosely around our circles. And what we do is um, we have uh, we generally set up groups and give access to certain areas of our Notion based on on where the authorities lie. So you might be, uh, we generally allow anybody to read any document within our Notion. So it's like complete transparency. 
Um, but uh, we scope our editing and sharing and invite privileges based on the the accountabilities and the authorities within the company. So the tech the tech group has their own space that they have control over. Marketing has their own space. Um, our product team uses Notion really heavily now, and that was a really interesting thing that we started off using. The product team was really heavily into Jira because uh, Confluence because mm -hmm. our the dev team uses uh, Jira for our ticketing and things like that. Um, and so we started off with Notion just with a small group of the tech team and, and, but the product team continued to use Confluence and there was definitely like a, a period of, of, uh, crossover there. But now like, uh, one of the product leads, um, messaged me the other day and was like, I'm obsessed with Notion now. And I was like, yes, you, you just got to get them to that point, right? Yeah. Just the <laughs> yeah. We talked, we talked about it and, and it's this thing where when you first use it, you have all these other tools in your head and you're expecting to recreate that, that exact experience in notion, mm -hmm. but it, it like, it doesn't really click right away for most people. And I was the same way when I got started with notion and Marie, you know, that really well, I fought it really hard because I was a kind of an Asana die hard for a long time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you the structure out of the box, so it's harder to know like where are the edges, um, where can I go, and it's kind of it's scary because it's so open ended. Um, but once you, so I just started doing this thing where I was always available to hop on and answer a question about the uh, about what they were trying to recreate, and a lot of times it would be something like uh, like oh well you know maybe you could do it like this instead, and it's less less close to what you want but it gives you all these things now and so i was able to i think show how notion can do 10 things instead of the one thing they really wanted but and then once once they start to see how it how it interlinks with all the different systems it really starts to shine i think and so what we started doing is creating these hot really top level resources so we have a a projects database we have technologies database um, the one thing that's really been super impactful for us, and especially in terms of transparency at the company, is every single meeting is documented in our meeting notes database. And so all of these all these things can be rolled up into different pages. So we have a project page, like a template that rolls up all of our meeting notes. It, and then um, each each team, like the product team, has a, a comms database, which talks that that's where they develop um, how they're going to release and announce features. So there's a, you know, how they're, how they're rolling out a product announcement on Facebook. Uh, we just shipped our first mobile app. So they're developing all these different procedures for how do we announce features internally? How do we announce features externally? How's it going to go to Facebook and stuff like that? So it's notions really cool because everybody has their own independent systems for developing things. And then we have these top level things that we just, we basically link everything together. So, you know, our product, our projects database has references to products, um, comms announcement. We have technical documentation for the project. We roll up all of our meeting notes for the project in there. And then we have like even higher level ones that are kind of roll ups for um, circles. So we have uh, a page that'll show all of the technical discussions that are happening. Um, we do these things called uh, ADRs, which is like a architectural decision record. Um, so somebody at the company wants to work on a project or wants to make a change, they can write a, a proposal essentially in Notion, and then we and then we take that through a, a you know a status process, and other engineers will look at it, and then then they execute what we call a spike, which is like kind of like a experimental phase. So we're documenting all that stuff in in Notion now, and so anybody can jump in at any time and and comment on what's being done at the company. And so we're, you know, everything is being logged in, in Notion. And it's really, ha it's really good because our company, the company I work for has been remote for 17 years. So like, they're like one of the like OGs in the remote space. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's really cool to see, you know, how Notion really just facilitates that. And uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been cool. It's been good to go from doing this with I do that I use notion internally with Marie at Okie Dokie for managing our stuff our home life like pretty much everything I also use it with a 30 35 person fire department so I started man organizing our fire department on notion and like <laughs> they were really funny because our chief was our chief at the annual chiefs meeting that I went to with him was like Ben built us an app it's amazing and I'm like no no it's, I'm like I didn't do this it's it's notion take the like, credit <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> so they have no idea what the what it is, but they love it because it it what we do is we you know I use it to organize all of our interdepartmental stuff. Like uh, now we have instead of instead of every time one fire de- firefighter gets a new credential, they would go into a spreadsheet and check it off and then reprint the whole thing and paste it on the wall. So now it's all in Notion, and I can just be, and so at a glance, he the chief can roll up and go. Who needs uh, who needs to refresh their um, their EMA uh, like emergency responder license or whatever? So we can do that. Mm. So that was like the small group, and then I've got now experience with Notion with like a hundred person team. Um, so yeah, I've I've had a nice experience with all that all of the different sizes. I think at this point, seeing all the challenges that come at scale. Uh, a couple of people did mention it'd be nice to see screenshots. I don't think we're gonna. Um, I think Crowdcast has a limit on kind of four screens at once. Um, there are a couple templates that folks have shared uh, in the remote work resources. Often it can be hard to do this level of screen sharing too, because there's generally sensitive information. And um, I know we didn't have permission from uh, Precision Nutrition to necessarily show meeting notes or names. It's, it can be hard to kind of scrub some of that data. But yeah, I mean, we have future, a lot of we have a lot of uh, sensitive like product development information that that you know would be difficult to share without doing some significant uh, like uh, re architecting editing or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. i can share some of my personal stuff uh, yeah Cool. I don't know if uh, Tara or Thor, you have anything to add in terms of uh, the challenges of maybe working with a team as you start scaling and kind of um, having a place to store your documentation or just kind of beginning to collaborate in a in a remote sense, either through Notion or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, with my team, we're still in, we're more into the Google Doc space still. Um, I've, I've tried to get people into Notion a little bit, but just getting into Google Docs and stuff has been more of a challenge there. So I'll first get them comfortable there before I move them over. Um, but currently the tools that work best for us is a combination of Google Docs, uh, Basecamp and Slack. Those are our three biggest tools that we use. Um, and to just really know when to use each tool effectively is like the most important thing out of it. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't realize when they first go remote, they just want to keep that in office communication going on a lot. And it seems very enticing, especially because Slack is right there. It has video calling built in. You can message each other constantly. But to know how to like really balance that synchronous and asynchronous communication so you know when to actually like kind of tap someone on the shoulder and talk to them or actually like give them time to do their work and keep their head down and get focused essentially. Um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges and not relying on your tech too much when you first go remote, it's, it's very tempting. So that's a big mm-hmm. thing is to kind of like back off a little bit and use it when it's needed for the right thing. Interesting. Yeah, I will totally second that as well, um, especially since uh, so we have a very small team uh, at what works. Um, and then I run a second company as well that also there's overlap between those two teams. But that's also a small team. And for us um, at What Works, I've been working remotely for over 11 years now. It's very comfortable for me. I very comfortable with living online. Um, but our community and operations advocate, who I think is watching right now, um, working from home for her was very new um, when she got hired a little over two years ago. Um, and so there was a, there's been a lot of like, well, do we do it? Do we talk here? Do we talk there? Why don't we talk in person more? Because she actually lives not too far from me, <laughs> and and so there's yeah, that's been a lot of managing. Like, what do what do we do where? Um, and so one thing that Notion has been, I mean, Notion's changed the way we work. But one thing that Notion's been very effective for us for is there's more we can do in one place now. Mm. Um, so before, where Slack was always the you know, it's it was the the chat tool, and then we had to decide: does it go in Asana? Does it go in Google Drive? Does it go over here? Now it's just okay. We check on something quick in Slack, and then all of the rest of the collaboration tends to happen directly in Notion. Um, and I think the other thing that Notion's really allowed for us as a team is honoring different people's working systems, working styles. Um, the way Shannon works is different than the way. I work. Um, and so we have places in our Notion setup that are um, sort of on a team level. They're the things that we've all sort of agreed this is a good way to do it. <laughs> and then there are things where, you know, I control my area and how I manage things, and she controls her area and how she manages things. And that might not work at a larger organization, but for a team of five, it works really well. And it allows us to have more ownership, I think, over our own 
work and allows us to lean into our own working styles more while still having those places where we can have um, a more centralized, more uniform style of working and collaboration. Yeah. And I mean, Tara, I know you've been doing like virtual events for a long, long time, but mm -hmm. um, are you just kind of noticing more and more businesses now? I mean, are people asking you about it? You must be hearing it kind of all over the place. Like, ah, how do I actually, tr how do I do this transition now? Like, what are you noticing in this space? Yeah, so it, I, I have to say that I think had it not been um, very personal to me first, I might not have noticed the chatter about it or I wouldn't have expected the chatter. But as everything was accelerating super duper fast, especially in the United States over the last 10 days, we were trying to figure out whether we could make a retreat in Palm Springs happen next oh. week that's been on the calendar for over nine, eight months now. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was super top of mind. What does it look like to take this event virtual? Um, at the same time, we were also planning or we were also hosting our 11th virtual conference at the membership community that we run. Um, and so I was starting to hear, start, not starting to hear, but starting to see, especially on Twitter, the need that other people were having, oh, virtual conferences, virtual retreats, virtual yeah. team meetings, which to me just seems really, really natural. But for a lot of people is just kind of deer Boring. in headlights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, so I, you know, we've been fielding questions and, um, and, and from people who have been in our orbit for a long time and have seen us do it, but don't necessarily know what it looks like on the back end. And so we have been talking a lot more about how we manage those events. Um, and we do absolutely do it in, in Notion. It's kind of just part of our system, but we're paying attention now more to what the system actually looks like. You know, I think there's a difference between having a system that you operate and feel really comfortable with and then having a system that you can share with someone else right. and so we're kind of navigating that right now which is really fun i think it's fun for everybody on the team but um but it's it's an interesting the transition between those two things i think is interesting yeah so then what's changed like you you said you've been doing virtual events for a long time is anything changing then now in your process or is it just in terms of how you're sharing that information or sharing like a how to with other people, best practices? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a noticing. So it's one of those things where like, you know, with I think with any of our strengths and skills, we kind of downplay how valuable they are mm -hmm. to other people. We downplay, um, you know, how other people might need them or why they might not automatically do things the way we do them. And yeah. so a huge thing that's, I think, just changed is what we notice about our systems, especially for virtual events, and just really being mindful of why do we do the things that we do the way that we do them. Um, and then, yes, the other thing that's changed is now I know, okay, we've got systems, people want them, let's get them out there to people in the easiest possible way. So we did an event on Crowdcast uh, last week. No, it wasn't last week. <laughs> It wasn't last year. It wasn't last week. It was Tuesday. <laughs> it felt <laughs> it like, like last ago. year. Uh, <laughs> a lot has changed. A lot of happened. Yeah, we did a, uh, an event on Tuesday where I kind of shared at least the strategic components, um, some of the logistical things behind how we approach um, hosting virtual events and the tools that we use and how we plan for those things. I'm going to be doing another one on Monday with Mighty Networks mm -hmm. and just kind of really working through that stuff. And eventually I'll get more content out around that. But yeah, it's, it's the process of noticing and then being able to share that with people that's really starting to shift things. Where do you think, um, and this is sort of to everyone, like where do you think most people are going to struggle when it comes to this transition? Because all of us have been doing this for a while and it sort of it does feel kind of natural, but folks who maybe aren't used to this, what are the biggest challenges or things that people are asking maybe the most questions about? Is it the tech? Are they just not sure? Is it the logistics? Is it sort of, uh, how do I, like what are the rules when you're online versus in person? Like where do you think people are going to, or where are they struggling the most do you think in this transition? Yeah, I mean, I think that tech is the thing that people think they're going to struggle with, but the tech is so good now and easy yeah. to use that it's really not that big a barrier. Once you get a feel for where you're going to be and how you're going to show up and who's going to be there, the technology is is pretty easy to navigate, I think, for most people who are used to doing something on computers, and that's most of us now. 
I think what people don't anticipate being a challenge that's a much bigger challenge is the lack of cues and expectations and structure that mm. being together in person lends to any kind of event or meeting experience. And so thinking through how you recreate, not recreate it, but how you do that differently in an mm. online event is going to be the place where most people struggle and where they where they think like, oh, this team's been together for 10 years. It'll be easy to get them all online. It may not be. It may actually be really challenging to get people to share honestly, to get them to collaborate with each other online. And I think that anyone who's organizing um, remote work meetings or events needs to be thinking about uh, how you get around that, how you build structure and purpose and uh, cues and expectations into the experience to help people actually engage with, mm. the, with the meeting in the way that they would in person. That's a great answer. Yeah, though I don't know if you have anything to add on that or, or Ben. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just mentioned like the tech is great. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Find whatever process works best for you and your team and just lean into it as much as you can just to alleviate any of those barriers. Um, but the biggest thing is uh, everyone's used to being in office and seeing people do the work. And they're not used to actually having to notice the output as much as they see the mm. input. And I've seen that a lot with non-tech driven companies. Um, my tech driven company, you know, we use Jira and we track hours and we do stuff like that. So all, all of that output has always been tracked in person, you know, out of office doesn't matter. Um, but like the more conventional jobs, the more administrative jobs, the, you know, the day to day jobs, they don't know how to be still held accountable for what they're doing. So build some sort of process, maybe lean into something you'd find in the tech space, like, like an agile system, like be standups or something where you can actually like see what someone's doing along the process and trust that they're doing the work. That's a really big portion mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Great yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree with all of that. And one thing that I've uh, recently, actually today, I think they, they started doing this at, at, at PN is that, uh, because of the, the climate right now, we actually started setting up three times per day that there's an open Zoom room and people can just come and, and talk and, and chat and it's completely unwork related. And the company has been doing Zoom since Zoom was a thing. And, and we have meetings and every day we do standups on Zoom. And that's, that's all how, entirely how we communicate is through video chat. Um, and so it's interesting because of the climate, like where you have to consider how the how the external environmental f factors are ch are changing the company dynamics as well and that you if you can't meet up in person what do you need to do to facilitate those you know, missing interactions so to speak as as Tara was mentioning um yeah i think it's i think it's important to to set to set the um, I think I think this is going to make us look at at organizational structures too. I mentioned that we use this thing called holacracy, and we we have this thing where essentially every two weeks we do um, we do we do uh, what what are called retros, and and we and there's usually somebody who's a secretary and a facilitator for these meetings online, and we talk about basically we do this this format that's. Um, what's working, what's not, and I'm sure Tara likes the what's working. <laughs> what's working, what's not, and what are you gonna commit to, to to improve the thing that you think isn't working? And typically it's, you know, uh, we do this for engineering, we do this for our, our more administrative circles. And so <clears throat> I think the format of, of something like Holacracy where people have accountabilities and they like, they're like the authority in that space. So they're responsible for getting those things done. And they're also responsible for seeking out experts in that space as well. And so I like with the traditional structures, you, 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 you tend to have like a manager who's like, are you getting things done? Like there's somebody that's checking in on you. And so I think with more traditional workspaces, you're, they're going to have to facilitate more like check-ins and things like that, where a company that has more distributed, uh, like autonomy, are I think are really going to thrive in this space because people kind of know what they're accountable for, and and those systems kind of just work really well together. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm finding really interesting uh, at our company, especially because we, you know, we basically, I mean, it's sometimes it's difficult, but we only hire like senior people. That there's a lot of expectation that people are are going to just 
do things that they're supposed to be doing and they don't need a lot of like handholding or training to get going and things like that. So it's challenging. But um, one thing we use Notion for now is uh, is onboarding. And I'm going to be onboarding a new engineer next week. And we have like a system where we kind of bring them into a specific group and they're only seeing the documentation and notion that they should based on their based on what groups they're in and what they can see. And then we and then basically we have this kind of onboarding checklist that we we're going to duplicate and I share that with the the new hire and myself and maybe like one of our engineering managers or something like that and then we walk them through that and so they can go in and and as they're going through the steps, like day one, here's what you're, here's what you need to do: set up all your accounts, get access to GitHub, you know, get these credentials, and they check it off as they go. And then they can actually highlight stuff and say, "Hey, I wasn't able to do this," and then I get notification that I need to go that. So we have these like records of how the onboarding went, and then we have a kind of, uh, you know, at the end of their onboarding period, they they're going to interview with me, they're going to interview with our engineering manager. So we're using Notion as well to facilitate those kind of interactions at the company. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm uh, hoping to convince PN to let you share your, your, like a scrubbed version of that onboarding template. Cause I think it's, it's really I, cool. Yeah. I mean, I, let me, I can share the onboarding template. I don't think there's really anything specific to that one. Let me have a look here. Why don't you talk about something else while I look it up? <laughs> well, I don't well, know if it, anyone, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, if you don't mind um, kind of jumping off of something that Ben mentioned, one thing that I've been really thinking about as not only a um, an employer, but also a community leader. And so that there's a lot of <laughs> overlap between management and, and community leadership is making room for different responses to what's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that that's another chat, like that's a people piece of the challenge. And I was hoping to come up with some brilliant way to relate notion to that. And I don't have that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we could do it because we can do anything with notion. But I think that, um, you know, if, if you're new to working remote, but even if you're an old hat like we are, um, it's really important to be regularly checking in with yourself in terms of your expectations of the people that you're working remotely with. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like I said before, we're used to kind of social cues and we can kind of read people yeah. and you can't read people when you're ro working remotely, it's really, really hard. Mm. Um, and so creating space for people to respond to differently, creating space um, for people to say how they're really doing those kinds of check-ins, um, whether you're a manager or just a team member who is interested in keeping things you know, operating as best they can and keeping the connections and the relationships going, I think that's a really important piece of what we're all navigating right now too. Love that. That's that's huge. I know I've talked a lot about how I use Notion as my daily journal and my weekly agenda, and I can see that my effectiveness over the last <laughs> two weeks is very low. <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to be patient with myself and compassionate with myself that uh, these are not normal times. It's not business as usual, and so our productivity is not going to be as high as maybe it is. And especially when you when you're in any kind of transition, you're not just going to work from home and suddenly everything's, you know, the same amount of productivity, just minus the travel time, things are a little bit different. And so I do think um, even companies like Notion, for example, for the first time, they're going remote, right? They were San Francisco based. I mean, they are San Francisco based, but now for the first time, the team is doing Zoom calls together and figuring out different ways to work. And so it, obviously they've got the tool Notion, which makes it a lot easier for them to collaborate. Um, but it, that is still a transition. And I think, again, that's just always going to take a little bit of ramp up time as people get familiar with these new routines. Yeah. So it says I can't share my screen because there's no seats left. You can't. I think um, the four, four is the max or something. I don't know. It says do you ask you the can host like to open the seat. Can you like toggle your video, Tara, and share a screen instead of your video? Do you know if you can do that? Let me try um, I think that you can. Oh, well, it looks like we're going to find out in a second. Maybe not. Ben, let us know if that if that no, works. No, it still says. No. Oh, sad. No um, but maybe in a, in a future session, you know, I think we do have a plan to do an onboarding specific session because I mm -hmm. think Notion is such a great tool for onboarding and just having that one place to kind of keep all that information there. But I like how you baked in the to do's as part of that onboarding, too. So it's not just like a static document. It's something that the person can interact with. Um, so I posted awesome a, a temporary it. screenshot in the chat if anybody wants to see the beginning of our Brilliant. of our uh, engineering 
onboarding thing. Awesome. Um, yeah, so it's basically a checklist for going through um, getting their account set up because we have, as an engineering department, a ton of stuff. And then there's you know links to our documentation database where we uh, give them instructions on setting up a local dev environment. Um, we actually have a internal tool that one of our engineers wrote that helps. You know, it, it's just like a one one command setup for installing and stuff like that. So it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, and then there's different stuff about how to get access to the documentation, what kind of coding principles we have, the platform architecture. Um, the our database schema is incredibly complex. So there's a whole documentation area on how to how to you know, understand what we're doing, um, account types and test users, how we organize our code. And then like the third day we get them started on understanding our management practices. Um, so there's a whole application that our uh, everyone has to learn how to use that shows the, the roles and the accountabilities you hold. Um, and then we have a very specific way of working with Git um, in terms of our workflows. So that's all documented. Um, and then we like day three set up a meeting with Jenny to get a tour of the application. So that you know you would link with our QA manager, who then will you know go through all the you know stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's the first week, and then there's like week two. Um, that's when they actually generally start working on coding and stuff. So we have a we basically have an onboarding thing, and you get assigned a kind of a mentor, and that person will pair with you on your first tickets in, in order to help you do that stuff. And one thing I find that but the one thing I absolutely love about working at PN is that we have like an ongoing mentorship type mm -hmm. thing. And every two weeks you do one on ones with your with a in, like a manager or or the CTO or something like that. And that's a place where you're able to say to to get that feedback on how you're doing, you know, how are you? Do you have any what what we call tensions with other employees? And how are you going to resolve that? Um, so I think that the move towards remote work is going to be really important to facilitate those kind of meetings between employees and and whether they're managers or coworkers, just to have that ongoing, you know, like a pulse of the organization to make sure everybody's working well together. I think yeah, the mentorship is is pretty key, especially in a transition, right? I think that's that's awesome. There was a question I saw in the sidebar that came up that I thought was was great. Um, how do I show my company I'm doing the work, i.e. creating a presentation, doing research online, writing a research paper, doing a market analysis with Notion to show I'm being productive toward what they would prefer with G Suite? <laughs> and then in all caps, they say they want an Excel spreadsheet created, but I use Notion. <laughs> Sorry for the caps lock. Um, <laughs> I think well, that's a very valid use of caps lock. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They say they want a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this too, but I always say with Notion, it's a bit of show, don't tell. Um, so it's like, hey, look what the tool can do. Or like, hey, here's this document I created for you. And the more that you can show the value of the tool without trying to get someone on board with the, the even the idea of learning a new tool. Um, so I could say, if you can show them what they want to see, in Notion and it's faster for you to produce and it's easy to share with them. Um, I don't, I rarely export anything from Notion. I just share the links with people. I'm like, here's a proposal. Yeah. Here's, I don't try to make it look like a nice formatted PDF because it's not a PDF. Mm -hmm. It's an interactive document. I can share a link with someone and I can update the data in real time and they're going to see that data. So I, I can imagine there's going to be some resistance with companies that aren't familiar with Notion. But again, if you can show the work that they want to see, in a way that they can read it and it's easy for you to do. I think it makes the case a lot, a lot easier. I don't know if anyone else has yeah. anything to add on that. Yeah, I would say like make like a daily, weekly check-in template that you can essentially put all that work into one spot using either you know relational databases or page linking, embedding if it comes from a third-party source like a spreadsheet or something, so they can yeah. see it on one spot and see how you know absorbable the content is, so they can see it in one place and reference it and see exactly what you're doing. Yeah, and I mean, Notion has um, the history in the page too, right? So, I mean, your mm -hmm. if your employer has access or other team members, you can you can see all those updates over time, just like you would with a Google Doc. So that's that's something mm -hmm. to to be aware of as well. Um, okay, I think 
Okay, should be synced now. Cool. A couple other questions that popped up. Um, Homesick Mac asked, my organization is switching over to remote work and we're using Zoom, Cisco meeting, workplace slash Facebook for companies. We're all over the place. People are not used to this and we're experiencing technical issues when some users cannot set up their web camera, sound, etc. We were recommending the Elgato CamLink 4K to all meeting hosts. They mostly have a DSLR or mirrorless camera. Uh, then that into USB, it's much better quality. What are our guests using hardware-wise? Hmm. Right share? now, I'm just using my MacBook, uh, my MacBook's camera currently. Um, it tends to look better if you have good lighting, so that's always a nice little pro tip. Um, some sort of lighting would have always. Um, if you're depending on like daylight, it can change it, throughout the call. Uh, lighting is probably one of the most important things when it comes to doing video calls. Um, but I don't think it, you know, the video call quality is always important as long as you can still see that person's, you know, face expressions and mode and so on. But if quality is something that's important to your team, lighting is probably the most undervalued thing that you can get. Mm. Completely agree with that. I don't think the hardware matters nearly as much as the lighting. Um, <laughs> I use a, a softbox light that I got on Amazon many years ago um, that I bounce off of our white ceiling. So, like, if I just have it on my face, I have a lot of there's a lot of shadow. It's a little harsh, even though it's a softbox light. Yep. So I use it to balance out the daylight in my office. But even just that off of the ceiling, I can kind of. By turning the light, I can kind of adjust the intensity and get a really nice soft light, as you can see. So this is like shades drawn on big windows, plus the soft box off the, bounced off the white ceiling. Um, and then I use, uh, hardware-wise, I'm on um, a, an iMac, but I use a lo uh, the Logitech um, C920, I think it's what it's called. It's one of the top webcams that shoots in in HD. Um, and typically that makes a really nice picture. And then mm -hmm. um, I like fancy microphones. So <laughs> uh, because I'm she a does podcaster. have a podcast. <laughs> uh, so I have a, a, a Rode Procaster uh, microphone um, instead of like a USB mic. But um, yeah, that's my hardware. Um, yeah, I, I, have the, I have the same ahead. webcam and, and I use the, the Yeti, which is kind of a low end, but, but decent um, po podcasting mic. And uh, I, I would say the majority of our company just uses um, basic headphones and, and the MacBook. Most, a lot of Mac, Mac people at the company, a lot of Linux people, they're the ones that have the most problems with the hardware for sure. Even like they're the techiest people, but usually it's one Linux guy being like, oh, my Oh, Zoom's not happy with my my camera today. You know, it's it's, but with Macs, like most people on Macs and and Windows, just just use a you know AirPods or regular headphones and and the regular mic. It it works great. The most computer built in um, cameras are fine. I think I find that most of the technology stuff ends up being because you're trying to plug in a bunch of different hardware. So if you just use what you've got right out of the box, it it's it's usually fine. Um, but it, it is nice to see people. Um, so yeah, we use, we use zoom for that. Yeah. Um, if I could also put in a plug for loom, um, yes. we haven't talked <laughs> um, so loom is a tool that allows you to record a video of your screen. So, I mean, people are familiar with screen capture video, but loom is really great because it's got, it's just got a lot of nice collaborative features to it. It embeds beautifully into notion and it allows you to have your face in the corner of it too, which adds, I think a really personal touch. Um, and in just in the last month, two months, I have become obsessed with Loom. We Loom yeah. everything. So I mentioned I have two companies. I have What Works, and then we also have a podcast production agency. And so I'm constantly Looming for our podcast clients. Um, the other thing that I have done with our podcast clients too, especially like thinking of mic setup, is I actually make them just right on my iPhone, make them little videos of me walking through how to set up a microphone, where things get plugged in. Again, it's a lot of stuff that I would take for granted. Like you just plug the things yeah. and there's only one way to plug it in. Like there's no, it's not magical. But that's like, that's me. That's just, I'm really super comfortable with these things. Our clients aren't. That's why they hired us in the first place. And it's probably yeah. the same, you know, it's true of, of team members as well. They're just not as comfortable, I think, as a lot of us are. Um, and so, you know, it's not just, I think 
Zoom and video conferencing is fantastic. And I think we also need to think about outside of the box for when we're not video conferencing as well. And what are the other technologies that we have at our disposal that allow us to have a more personal interaction with people to help them kind of navigate stuff that is unfamiliar to them. And just making a video on your phone is a great way to do that. Yeah, and similarly with Notion onboarding documents, like I've worked with some clients that um, make Loom videos for their team members. And so when they're introducing them to Notion, it's like, hey, Wyatt just wanted to welcome you, you know, and you've got like built in conversational elements, you're not just throwing someone into the tool and expecting them to just like know where to click, you're actually kind of giving them a bit of a guided walkthrough. So Loom can Loom and just, you know, taking simple videos can be such a way to create that warmth when people are encountering a totally new tech and they're already feeling kind of overwhelmed. Um, so just giving that extra personal touch, I think really, really matters. Um, but similarly yeah, to the conversation. That, uh, gifts as well. Gifts, yeah. Gifts into notion documents just so they don't have to worry about clicking on it and yeah. making them do a call to action. It just kind of plays and shows them what to do before they have to do it. Smart. I thought you were talking about like meme gifts, but that also works. Yeah, that <laughs> <actual> gifts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I was just going to add to to the question about you know what tech to use. Like only recently did I get like a, a Sony A fifty one hundred or something uh, camera, but before that, I'm just using a simple Logitech. I've got the the Yeti mic as well, same as Ben's. the The key with the Yeti mic is like get it off the table. It has to be on like an external situation because otherwise it picks up every single little little keyboard tap but i'm all for keeping it simple i think the cam link does add an extra layer of complexity that the average person who maybe isn't comfortable with loom it might be a bit much um, zoom sorry um, so i think keeping it simple when you're trying to get everyone on the same page and create a notion document that goes over like here are the tools that we're using and here's what's going to make your life easier and just make sure it's all documented as much as possible to try and keep people on the same page yeah it's it's a lot to, to get everybody comfortable. So hopefully that answers your, your question there, Mac. Um, ooh, how do I land a job as a remote designer? That's a big question. <laughs> Does anyone have any tips yeah, on? Def definitely a big question. It's, it's not a, it's not a hard, uh, a job to find, but a lot is going to be very uh, saturated right now in general. Um, it depends on the company and like the mindset around it. Some designers still think they have to like use physical tangible goods to like kind of mock up and ideate before they get to the design phase. Um, so there's lots of online tools that you can go through that process. Um, Envision offers free software called Freehand where people can like design together and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of barriers uh, to lower the barrier of entry, but um, it's definitely hard, I would say, make um, a very good portfolio um, and really focus on case studies and user interaction a lot. Yeah, you got to stand. How do you stand out in a sea of other designers? I think is really, really the question. Because um, right now, every anyone who's hiring right now, it's gonna it's gonna be remote, um, and people may not be hiring as much right now if anything, right? So it is gonna be a tough time. And so uh, more than ever, we're gonna to have to stand out. We're probably gonna to have to be really specific about our skill set and really know what we're good at and really know what we wanna do. And so people are gonna to have to get really creative, I think, in terms of the way that they're displaying uh, their work and, and what they're good at and what they want. So I think probably niching more specifically is gonna be really helpful in these times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Christopher said, thank you. There's resistance because everyone's continually using G Suite and managers can log in and actively see an employee's progress. And I don't want to show that I'm not complying, but I like the idea of communicating more regularly by sharing the link. Okay, cool. Uh, Mike said, it seems like the, pr the biggest problem with Notion is the lack of workflow ingrained in the software. This was discussed earlier. Templates seem like a quick win when first getting started with Notion, but I feel most templates um, but I feel most templates, they are better examples than starting points. Any thoughts on this? I'd 100% agree with that. I think that, I mean, that's, I'm, I would say something pretty controversial, but I think that most Notion templates are pretty useless for most companies, to be honest. Like they're great for, I think they're great for understanding what the intention of the product is. But what I'm finding is that, especially with my company that I'm working with now, that you really need somebody at the company who is going to be 
the notion I person that mm -hmm. everyone that you need to that person needs to know the software really well and and also know the operations of the company really well so that they can describe in notion language what the operations are and and create you know templates and and top level databases that facilitate the, the interactions between people at the company um like I said, when I started, uh, one of the engineers, uh, my engineering manager, Mattia, he had used Notion in the past and he was like, oh, I love it. Um, but like, I need you to do, he basically said, you're going to do a spike on on setting up Notion and showing the, because we had all of our documentation in GitHub, which is was quite difficult to edit and wasn't really, it didn't cover, it covered mostly just code stuff, not company stuff. And so, you know, I had the th feeling that we could start moving all of our documentation for all teams into Notion. But he basically said, you, you're going to need to get people to, to buy into this. So you need to spend some time setting it up, showing what's possible. And, you know, I did that, that for a while. And engineering basically was like, love it. We're, we're doing it. But there was some there was definitely pushback from other people at the team on the team. And so I had to essentially it took it just right now i'm in a process where it, our notion is pretty messy right now and i'm i'm letting all the different departments explore and figure things out and i just i'm just open to people coming in and asking me questions i'll hop on a call with them show them how to set something up and now people are start it's starting to click for people but you know this is 6 months of my time where i'm i'm basically just open to let me show you how to do things and i'm doing a lot of extra work to to you know organize things and and make suggestions and i don't want to be too prescriptive about how people use it but right now i'm in this phase of let's see how product uses it let's see how client care uses it and then i'm going to start creating these kind of glue pieces that bring all those pieces together and reorganize it and then kind of ship v2 of our product because that's the way I see Notion is like you're building a product, you're building a database of that, you know, you're building the product of the operations of your company and describing that that system in a database format. And so, yeah, like templates aren't super helpful. I don't I don't know, like everybody's in the chat going, hey, can we see some templates? Can we see some templates? Right. <laughs> Not. It's like our our templates for our company aren't going to help you like you. You have mm. to you have to design you know, you have to really adopt how Notion works and then you can start building your company's systems. Like it's going to look completely different for every company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so daunting to use it. Um, you know, there's yeah. this whole no, no code movement, but I, I, I sometimes like irk at that, at that thing because it implies simplicity uh, when we're saying, oh, there's no coding involved, but it's, <laughs> it's incredibly... <magic. laughs> it's in it's incredibly technical still and there is a there is a language still that you have to learn mm -hmm. and that language is notion um yeah and so the ex expecting people to switch from in-person systems to remote systems and then learn notion and then learn zoom and all this <laughs> stuff but give you you're gonna have to give yourself and your company six to six to twelve months to really adopt to these new patterns it's it's really a challenge yeah yeah, I mean, again, I, I work with a lot of people inside of Notion. I teach people how to use Notion and there's learning Notion, the tool. And then like, do you have a workflow yet, right? There's like almost these two tracks. Um, and so trying to teach those at the same time can be a little bit of a challenge. And so, um, you know, sometimes I recommend certain structures to folks, but that doesn't always work for every team. It's like, are you collaborating uh, with your partner? Are you collaborating and using it to manage your home life? Is it with a team, a team of 20, of 100? Like, it's going to be very different at each scale. Um, and like, that's what Ben was saying with the groups and circles and, and sort of thing, you might mm. need to do a little bit more engineering and that takes time. You're not just going to get set up in a weekend. And I think that is what can turn people off from Notion is like there is a big learning curve. Um, and I, I feel like some people sort of see the there's like a little sparkle. And they're like, oh, I see what's possible here. I'm willing I'm willing to invest that time and go all in. But yeah, it is a, it is a commitment and it's pretty it's pretty mm. intense. I found what what worked for us worked really well as you scale as well, which is that we tried to we tried to build the system that worked for our company at first and and I we were kind of fighting each other on a lot of stuff but then when we realized you know you can create your own systems and if you agree on the shared systems yeah. that I usually call them the top the top level assets so you know you have your meeting notes your projects like the things that are common to all parties all teams and then everyone can create their own dashboards 
you know, roll up dashboards and things like that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm experimenting with now at our company is, is creating dashboard templates. So I can say, you know, here's a dashboard template that shows you this and this and this, and you can make it yours, just copy it to your private thing. And, and then it's still using the, the global assets, but you're creating, you know, I call them, I call them database, like page rollups, because they have this concept and notion of rollups, which pull content from databases and, and remix them. So you, you think of it as, you know, pull stuff from your top level stuff and everybody has to follow the formats in the top level stuff. And, you know, it's, it's more restrictive, but within your own pages, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And then what I, what I love about notion is that we can look at what other people are doing and see the common patterns and then bring those patterns back into our, our top yes. level structures. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that really worked well with us where we have the, you know, I have my own dashboard. I have my own agendas, but we have links to our projects. So, you know, our projects database has Ben's agendas and Marie's agendas. Um, that doesn't really work at a hundred person scale. So, right. you know, you, um, so you have to have these pages where people can remix the content from the company's assets. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a pretty advanced notion topic. So it takes a while for people to get to that point. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you guys would agree with that too, with, um, just having those custom dashboards and how powerful that can be because I've seen clients who like just get overwhelmed by a table. They're like, ah, it just looks like a database, right? And they get really freaked out. Yeah. But then as soon as you change it to a Kanban board or something, they're like, ah, that works with my brain. So I think it can take a while to get to yeah. know, um, you might make one setup, but realize that's gonna confuse some team members. And so you might need to make it a bit more visual for a different team member and you have the capacity to do that. So one of the first things I recommend for people is like, who is the core team? Make sure everyone has a custom dashboard and then you can figure out, you know, mm. again, what those top level items are. I think one thing that, one thing that I was talking with my engineering manager yesterday, in, in fact, that I find is the struggle in this is that most companies want a process that is is not fluid, and you know, it, that's just not how things work. Like, um, and I think what like something like Asana is like, this is your process, follow it, and then if if you want to deviate from that at all, you're 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 out of luck. Like, and uh, so we use you know we use agile development processes and stuff like that, but we deviate it from it so much that sometimes the you know, the difference between scrum and, and agile boards in Jira, like we're, we're not even following what they're doing. And, and, you know, sometimes people, new engineers come in and, and get confused because we, you know, we deviate from it so much that it doesn't really make sense. It's like this in-between process. And our PN, PN starts with this thing that, um, they're basically like, Hey, we'll try this. If it doesn't work, we'll change it. Like there, there's no, there is no process that we are, we stick to ever mm -hmm. that is written in stone. And so, you know, that's, that I think is going to be the test for a lot of companies going forwards is that they're going to have to figure out how to use multiple tools to create these, you know, fluid processes that can be adaptive rather than agile, because I think agile doesn't really even fit what, what a lot of companies are doing these days. So yeah, it's tricky. And I'm sure you, you know, Tara and Thor, you'd both agree that your space today probably looks a lot different than it did three months ago, six oh, months yeah. ago, a year ago, oh, yeah. right? It's like, it, it it's a tool that almost. I think people want to get it right when they first set it up, yeah. but it's a tool that gets stronger the more and more that you use it and you figure out where there's friction and you start making things better and better. And so I think it's kind of inevitable that, like Ben said, it's going to have to be flexible because it's going to, it's a tool that changes the way you think a little bit. And so it's mm -hmm. so powerful if you give it that breathing room to kind of, to play over time, which I think can be hard for a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ours has shifted a ton in the, we've been using it, I guess, at least 16 months now, at least in earnest. And um, yeah, it's changed a ton since we started. And there's so much more room yeah, to make it better. All the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's weekly. it keeps getting I can't, I realistically more simple and more complicated <laughs> um, just because then you can customize it to your own liking, like Ben said, make your own setups and dashboards to, yeah. to, to really wind down all the information. If you have it more complicated at the high level, it's harder to narrow it down to the specific things. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, another question came in from Natasha. What kind of jobs slash offerings do you see could be offered around Notion? What type of consulting and digital products? I love that you asked this, Natasha, because 
uh, you know, probably since doing these office hours, I get emails every day from people saying like, hey, can you help me with my setup? Or how do I do this or whatever? Um, I teach Notion again, like I have a course on Notion and people who've taken my course are now consulting with Notion. So, and I will say like, given the climate right now, those inquiries have not slowed down. So I do think there's a really interesting opportunity for people who have mastered the tools and mastered them in really interesting use cases to either sell their templates, share their templates. I know Tara has been releasing. She's got like a leadership dashboard that, um, and I don't know how that's been doing, Tara, you know, if you have any opinions on kind of selling templates and how that's been working for you. Yeah, we so we were going to release it later this month, and I realized we needed to release it now <laughs> because I'm <laughs> useful for people. Yeah. So we also made it pay what you want. Um, so I released it on Sunday, and I had no idea what to expect. We've not sold and or we've not sent any kind of direct sales emails. It's all been just sort of like PS, PS, mention it here, mention it there, and the sales have blown my mind <laughs> in That's terms amazing. yeah but when you consider like the fact that we're really you know there's only a certain percentage of my audience who's even on notion to begin with and then to think how many sales we've had as a percentage of that it's huge um one thing i saw i think was from curtis he said something oh he says i'm a process engineer and having a process is always the missing step zero um kind of in regards to the template conversation that's essentially how i'm thinking about the templates that i'm selling too um well we have one that we're selling now there will be more there's more in process as we speak um, that it's, yes, it's, there's a template and there's a done for you element to it, but my goal is actually to teach a process or to relate a process because for our members, that's often, or our audience, that's what's, that is the missing piece is that Absolutely. they know how to do things. They've done things in the past, but there isn't a, they don't, they're not aware of the process yet. So when I'm pulling together a template, it's not just the database here and the properties there and these things linked together and the setup. It's literally going in and talking people through using Loom. Yeah. <laughs> Here's why <laughs> you're doing it this way. Here are some things to think about. Here's, um, you know, if, if this is happening, do this. If this is happening, do this. Here's how to customize it for your process. And so I think, think I do think that there is absolutely value and need for templates as a starting point, if not a done for you solution. But I also think that there's an underlying value that can help you create a truly incredible product if you're really thinking through what's the process that I'm actually yeah. relating here. What's what is the real need that I'm uh, that I'm filling? Because it's not just the template. There's something else going on there. I think that's a, a really powerful distinction is like the template has to be baked in or like the process and the template yes. are kind of baked in that instructional element is there. The sort of why we're setting it up this way, why we're doing it that way. And I think I've also been guilty too of like, oh, here's templates, here's these task things. And then people have questions they are like, but what's that formula doing? Or how is that connected? Right. <laughs> and so I do think you have to be mindful again, like templates are gonna be most powerful when that system is kind of taught as part of that template. Um, and again, I've seen so many interesting templates, like a, a real estate agent, you know, that has a whole system for managing and tracking everything with our clients and customers. And so I was like, the real estate agent world needs these sorts of templates for their mm -hmm. own workflows. How do you track all of this information? There's so many data points. Um, so I was like, I think you could monetize those templates. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of interesting industries where if you can kind of master the tool and you've been using it regularly, you can sell templates, you can sell instruction, you could sell consulting. There's a lot of interesting ways you could kind of bake uh, what you're already doing into Notion and, and monetize it. Um, yeah. And I just started with like a pay what you want. I was like, oh, it, was this template helpful? Buy me a coffee or, yeah. or pay what you want. So if you just want to test the waters with it, that can be an interesting way to do that. Yeah. I saw Mike said just now too, there seems to be a really huge space between templates and consulting. And I think the space between mm. those two things is productized service delivery. Yes. Um, <laughs> right. And there is real good profit to be made in productized service delivery. Um, and Notion is such a powerful tool for 
productized service delivery and mm -hmm. and giving people something that feels incredibly tangible while you're doing it. So, I mean, on the podcast, podcast agency side of things, that's what we're working on now. We have dashboards that we've set up for our clients. We have a productized system over there that people purchase on a done for you level. But now we're translating that into a template that will deliver in a program form that will be again a template or a, a productized delivery and then from there we'll go one step further to actually just handing it over to people and letting them do it for themselves but yeah, yeah i do think there's a huge space there that is ripe for oh yes good stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> oh and another like really interesting way that I, i've seen people use it and again my course is on notion like it's about notion but it also lives inside of notion yeah. so you're consuming the content inside of notion notion's not an online course platform i mean we have an online course platform and i'm still delivering my course in notion because it's sort of i'm teaching the tool in the place that they're they're sort of using the tool so powerful. but you know things like um you know fitness instructors uh, like make your content library right you've got beautiful gallery view, you've got instructions, you can sort the data in different ways. So people teaching and, and kind of creating their own digital content libraries inside of Notion, and you can just share a link with someone, it's literally never been easier to share your content with people. So I think if you're just trying to get your, your content up and running quickly for maybe things that you've already created assets for and you just need to start selling in a digital format, sign up for Gumroad, attach a link to your your Notion URL and start selling that. And, and I think there's just so many interesting opportunities to kind of, uh, in a way, like courseify or productize mm -hmm. your content in interesting ways. So I have mm -hmm. lots of opinions on that. You can hit me up on Twitter anytime. I'd be happy to, <laughs> to chat more about that. Tag um, me too. I want to talk. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would, I'd love to, um, I would love to chat more about like, productizing, like thinking really about Notion as a, as a tool for actually earning more income. And again, this very strange time where we're all maybe a little bit more conscious about this and how do we make money in creative and interesting ways as things yeah. maybe slow down with different business owners. Yeah. Um, I've seen a couple people say too that, you know, right now, especially they're reluctant to spend money on learning on something like Notion. And that's very fair and understandable. And I think if you're a Notion lover and you have something to teach and share just because you're not spending money doesn't mean other people yes. aren't spending money. Mm -hmm. So if you are finding yourself with an income deficit right now, if you find yourself in a precarious position and this is something you love, it's something and, and you've got skills or knowledge or experience that you can bake into something like a Notion template or a course that you can deliver on Notion other people are buying. We've made a lot of money in the last week, not because we've been opportunists out there trying to prey on people, but just because we have what people need and want right now. And it's filling very real needs for people. So um, yeah, I think that's really something to keep in mind. Yeah, I might have to do a Maybe a future office hours all and monetizing notion <laughs> templates and processes, right? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you know, Mike said he's still buying courses right now, stuck at home with too much time during self isolation. I'm definitely catching up on all my creative live courses, and you know, <laughs> I've lots of online courses that I haven't finished yet. So I think now's the time. I think for people to to learn more. Uh, there's YouTube, there's so much amazing content on YouTube, right? Like I, I've been trying to share um, a lot of what I'm doing on YouTube as well. So yeah, um, I mean, even Marie's Notion Mastery channel on YouTube is is basically a, you know, pretty awesome 101. There's a ton of ton of ton of ton of training for free yeah, on yeah. YouTube. So definitely recommend those. Yep. Um, I'll definitely be adding adding some more videos there because i feel like people are probably spending a lot more time in notion <laughs> or at least a lot more time at home kind of working on their processes right mm -hmm. so um i don't know if anyone else has any any final questions for for the group um otherwise i know we're sort of at the top of the hour so just wanted to say thank you to all of you for all of your insight in this topic of remote work. I know that uh, it's only going to evolve. If you have any additional resources or things that you thought of that came up, again, um, I've tried to include your resources in that remote work resources button at the bottom of this video. But if you have anything else that you want to add, just shoot it over to me. I'll make sure to add it to that uh, document. Tara's uh, leadership dashboard is in there. I know Thor has a remote working template as well. Um, 
future sessions, maybe we'll do a bit more screen sharing, but just thought it might be interesting to have a few more voices on this uh, this topic right now. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to connect with you both online, what's the best place to find you? Um, probably for this yeah, crowd, Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Yeah, Twitter? I'm at Tara Gentili on Twitter. I'll pop it into the chat. Perfect. Yeah, I'll drop mine on there too as well. Cool. Thanks everybody for coming today and uh, yeah, keep us posted and say hello. I think all of us are pretty active on Twitter. So um, I'm definitely curious kind of how people are getting on with uh, with remote work. And if anyone has um, is curious about doing the virtual event side of things too, I know Tara, you have a, a pre-existing Crowdcast that you ran mm -hmm. that people can join. I think it's in the in the link below. Yeah. So if you click on, or if, yeah, or if you click on my Crowdcast account here, it should take you to, and you'll see the sessions Perfect. that we've done this week. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming Thank and you. good luck as you enter the world of remote work. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.